Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, for the last few weeks I've been pretty busy over on my new channel, Research Flat Moon. And as a result, I haven't put out a lot of videos on Bob the Science Guy. Well, I thought that I would re-release some of my new work from the new channel over here on my main channel and get it a little more exposure. Now there's a link to my new channel in the description of this video and I would appreciate it if you would follow that and give me a, a sub over on my new channel and follow me there. So enjoy the presentation and I'll see you again soon. Now this is my personal favorite and that is how can you possibly have a, a gas pressure next to the vacuum of space without a container? Now this is the classic creationism argument against evolution, where somehow evolution and having gas pressure next to the vacuum of space are a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. We have gas pressure in our atmosphere and we have a pressure gradient in that atmosphere. Let me point out an obvious fact first and foremost. We have atmospheric pressure around us. We can measure it. It's reality. We also have a pressure gradient in our atmosphere. That's how an aircraft altimeter works. Now, if your theory on the second law of thermodynamics says that that's impossible, yet reality says it's occurring and it's measurable, your theory and your understanding of the second law of thermodynamics is wrong. You need to rethink your entire position before you go any further. But just to humor you, let's go ahead and continue. Under the second law of thermodynamics, the pressure would be equal at all levels of the atmosphere from the ground up to the container. This is a basic misunderstanding of the second law of thermodynamics. So let's go ahead and have a chat about the second law of thermodynamics. And let's consider a system. If we have a container and I release gas into that container, that gas will equalize in pressure throughout the container. However, if I put a tube into the container, and I attach a motor or a pump to that tube, and I pull the air out by applying a force on the mass of the air, I can create a vacuum in that chamber. That's how we make vacuum chambers on Earth. Now, if I stop applying that work, the second law of thermodynamics will indicate that gas from the higher pressure in the atmosphere will go backwards through the tube and will expand into the vacuum in the chamber until such time as that both the vacuum chamber and the outside air have the same pressure. In order to pull the gas out, again, I have to do work on the mass of the gas and pull it out with the pump. Now the atmospheric pressure and the vacuum in the container are two different pressures connected by a pipe. The reason that they don't equalize and we have a pressure gradient is that we are applying work with the pump to force that pressure gradient to occur. We are reversing the natural tendency of entropy. Now, QE understands this, and he understands that we have a pressure gradient in the atmosphere. So why isn't there a container between Mount Everest and sea level? Because there's about one third the gas pressure at Mount Everest than there is at sea level. So let's see how his argument goes. Which comes first, gas pressure or gas pressure gradients? What an interesting way of phrasing it. If there is no force on the gas, the gas will simply disperse. And if a force acts upon that gas, you will have a gas pressure gradient. So how do we have gas pressure without a container? Let's use the Earth's atmosphere as an example. Again, we have gas pressure of 14.7 pounds at sea level. As we get up above the Kármán line, that gas pressure essentially goes to zero. Why do we have a pressure gradient? Because there is work being performed on the atmosphere. There is a force acting and displacing the mass of the atmosphere, just like the pump was applying a force and displacing the mass of the gas as we created the vacuum chamber. Now, perhaps a better way to visualize this is to look at this illustration. At five and a half kilometers above the surface, 50% of the air of the atmosphere is below you. However, there's another 95 kilometers of atmosphere above you to the Kármán line. So what is moving the mass of the air from above 5.5 kilometers to below 5.5 kilometers and setting up this pressure gradient? There is work being performed on the atmosphere. 
Work is defined as the displacement of mass in the direction of an applied force. The fact that the mass of the atmosphere is being displaced downward confirms that there is a downward force acting upon it. So if you want to get right down to it, the fact that there is a pressure gradient in the atmosphere of the Earth confirms that there is a downward force acting on the mass of the atmosphere. That force is called gravity. The pressure gradient confirms the existence of gravity. Okay, consequent. Gas pressure, necessary antecedent, container. No, that's not the case. You see, this is again a fallacious argument because it is not a necessary antecedent to gas pressure to have a container. You can do it by applying a force to the mass of the gas. In other words, performing work on the system. The second law of thermodynamics, as he is understanding it, is a closed system without work being performed on it. In reality, the second law of thermodynamics does take into account work being performed on it. And as a result, you have a different value at the end. And in our case, that's why we have gas pressure in our atmosphere and a pressure gradient. Absent of external force acting on the mass of the gas, you will have no pressure gradient. Now here's the other problem that they run into is they're confusing gas pressure with atmospheric pressure. Gas pressure is measured as a force on the walls of its container. However, when I go outside with a barometer, I can measure a gas pressure without a container in sight. So again, this is simply irrelevant. Now I've used gas pressure to talk about atmospheric pressure in this video. The reason that I do that is that this is something that most middle schoolers are taught and the concept is very well understood. But let me clarify it. Gas pressure is a force over area. Atmospheric pressure is the weight which is the mass times the acceleration of gravity of the column of air above you. Now air is approximately 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and some trace elements. It has mass. The acceleration of gravity acts on that mass to create a force. Force equals mass times acceleration. In this case, weight is a force and equals mass times the acceleration of gravity because we're talking about situations here on the surface of the earth. So pressure expanding out onto the walls of a container is gas pressure. The weight of gas pushing downward is atmospheric pressure. So for example, the gas pressure within the Apollo Command capsule and the atmospheric pressure at the top of Mount Everest are both about five or six pounds per square inch. At the top of Mount Everest, it is atmospheric pressure because it is the mass of the gas in the atmosphere above Mount Everest being pulled down and accelerated downward by gravity. Whereas the gas pressure in the Apollo Command capsule is being pumped into a closed space until the gas pressure within that space rises up to about five to six pounds per square inch. Now recently I had the opportunity to interview Ranty formerly Ranty Flat Earth. He is a well-known flat earther that basically ran into some evidence that he couldn't reconcile and realizes now that the earth is indeed a sphere. He gave me some very good insights into the flat earth community and there'll actually be a full series on this. This is what I'm working on next. But basically what happens with the flat earth is they hear these explanations, these excuses to try and deny evidence and promote their flat earth narrative. They never look at the debunking videos because they only want to hear their own opinion. This has been explained to Quantum Eraser and many other flat earthers many times. All six of these issues have been thoroughly explained to him, yet they still parrot these. It's as if they never listened and then just continued to say the same thing, thinking that everybody else suddenly forgot the explanation. So as much as I would like to go into the actual debunking of these things, uh, as I did on Bob the Science Guy, I think on this channel it's going to be much more interesting to look into the mindset of the Flat Earth, to try and figure out how they went down this rabbit hole. These are reasonably intelligent functional adults 
yet they buy into something as silly as the flat earth, something that we have disproven 2,500 years ago. And we can disprove on a daily basis using simple items found around the house. I actually measured the size of, of the earth using my nameplate off my desk at my office in Marquette recently on the equinox between patients. I just measured a shadow and I came up with a radius of the earth within about 12 kilometers. It's something that we can all do and it's something that all flat earthers can do. Yet why do they choose not to? That's what we're going to look into in this channel. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. Remember to hit that like and subscribe. We do have Patreons and channel memberships over on Bob the Science Guy. And I appreciate your support of this channel. And I'm looking forward to this new part of the journey. Take care, guys. Bye.